Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'm going to do it in this um, screen presentation because it's a lot easier for me to um, show the videos that I have on Zoom, uh, Zoom or uh, excuse me, um, YouTube today. So um, we're going to do a brief overview of antipsychotic medications. This is really important for our um, consumers because a large number of consumers receive this class of medications and for a whole variety of reasons. And these are medications that we have to watch closely. So I do think this is really important um, for our um, caregivers. So let me just tell you again a little bit about how this mod module works. It's on a Zoom platform, so it's recorded and you can actually go to the um, VMRC website once it's posted and review uh, this if you want, or even show it in your facility again, if you would like to do that. And as I usually do, I have some content that comes from YouTube videos, which I think is good, but I can never guarantee um, entirely um, another author's work, but I do think that they are good. And this module does provide CE credit for you. So again, you'll be contacting um, Vicki Fisher, although not for the next few days, perhaps um, Lorraine Rodriguez uh, would be the one to contact in the short term. But as usual, there'll be a quiz that you can get and then you can take it in whatever way you want. You can take it, answer it and scan it back or, or just send the answers in an email, whichever, and we'll get you your certificate. So I wanted to talk a little bit first about psychotropic medications, just some general comments about things that you should realize about these. So no matter what group of psychotropic agents we're talking about by class, there are what we call FDA approved indications. And these are the things that the companies have done large scale clinical trials on and have met FDA requirements. And then those results have been reviewed by the FDA and the drug is then approved. And we call those uh, things that they tested it for approved indications. So they always have a list of specific reasons that they can be used that have been looked at by um, the uh, FDA. Now, that is not to say, again, that a uh, prescriber um, can't use a medication for something that it's not labeled for. If, in fact, um, the standard of that community, that discipline of practitioners uses the medication routinely in a certain way, even though it's not an approved indication, they can do that, and that's called an unlabeled use. Now, another thing to remember about any medication, and I don't care if it's non-prescription or prescription, all medications have side effects. And so um, this class of medications happens to have some significant side effects that we have to pay attention to, but there's no medication that has no side effects. And again, with any medication, while we generally know the most common side effects and the most serious effects that can happen from these drugs, Everyone is an individual, and sometimes we see something that we've not seen before or that is very highly unusual. So your consumers that you're working with may have um, reactions that uh, are not common or that we actually haven't seen before. And then another thing to remember is that, especially with the psychotropic medications, sometimes the side effects can mimic what would be um, sample, uh, examples of symptoms of a um, mental condition. So for instance, there's a problem we're going to look at in a few minutes called akathisia. And what that is, is a restlessness and an inability to sit still. And obviously that could look like anxiety or, or any number of other things. And so it's always, not always clear um, when you're looking at a patient, are they having a side effect or is this something else? And another thing about psychotropic medications is that they help us to manage symptoms of mental disorders but they're not curative. So if you're um, taking a medication and it controls your symptoms and you stop taking it, you may have those symptoms again. Finally, um, while we know the basic pharmacology of these drugs that we're using, in the final analysis, we're not exactly sure how they work in the central nervous system in terms of efficacy. So we're working on that and looking at it but uh, many times we don't know exactly what they're doing um, uh, to, to mitigate the mental illness. Some other things to think about, um, some medications can actually um, themselves cause side effects that look like they're psychiatric in nature. For instance, there's some kinds of 
of antihypertensive or blood pressure medications that can cause things that look like depression, um, et cetera. Another thing that's very common with consumers um, at BMRC is that they're very often on more than one psychotropic medication. In fact, I think combinations is more common than to see somebody on just one of these uh, agents. Another thing to think about is whether or not your consumer uh, has the freedom to leave your facility or to go out, or if you know they happen to be um, cared for by um, in, in their own uh, home setting or their own apartment setting or whatever, is that uh, if they are out of um, your purview, then they may get involved with illicit substances that have psychological effects. And so we do have to think about that in some of our consumers. Other things uh, that can happen is that we may find some people are more sensitive to the effects of psychotropics than others. And I see that in the hospital quite frequently where somebody will come in, we'll give them what looks like a starting dose of medication and all of a sudden I have somebody who has side effects. So um, even though many of these side effects are what we call dose related, in other words, the higher the dose, the more likely the side effects, that's not always the case. Some people tend to be uh, more sensitive to, to medications. Finally, um, I just wanna emphasize that we don't use psychotropic medications as a form of restraint. Um, yes, we can use them if, if patients are aggressive or hostile or acting out to help them calm down, but we don't keep people medicated to control behavior. Um, we use non-medication um, modalities for that. So it's really important to remember that we don't use what, we, what has been called chemical straitjackets. So what are antipsychotic anti medications? Well, as you can tell for the, from the name, they're obviously used to treat psychosis. And when they were originally developed, um, they were designed primarily to treat psychosis related, for instance, to schizophrenia. And that's the population where most of these were originally used. And the word psychosis is something that there's a lot of confusion around that unless you work in the field. But what psychosis means primarily is that the person either has hallucinations, which are sensory um, experiences, or they have delusions, which are incorrect or false beliefs, and they could have both. So while psychosis is, is a broader term than that, these are the two things that we usually talk about, and these are the two things that antipsychotic medications um, tend to help. Now, since we started using these medications um, decades ago, um, especially with the newer, what we call second generation antipsychotics, what we found is that they are helpful for other mental disorders, particularly uh, bipolar disorder, where we frequently have uh, patients on these medications to help control um, mania or bipolar depression. And then for uh, depression itself, what we call unipolar depression, um, you may have seen ads on television, for instance, that uh, show a person who's hopefully an actor, but um, is portraying someone who has depression being treated with an antipsychotic medication because the antidepressant didn't um, completely cure the depression. And we call that adjunctive use. And so you can see um, drugs, for instance, quetiapine being added to an antidepressant for some people have depression, but not completely relieved by the what we call formally um, an antidepressant medication. And then, as I said, there are a number of off-label uses um, to control aggression, to, con to control behavioral outbursts and some of these things. Um, that is clearly, um, in most instances, what we would call an off-label use. And once again, if you had a consumer who, who had these behavioral outbursts and it was something unusual, um, these drugs will be used hopefully for a short period of time until circumstances change or we're able to use other modalities so that we don't have to continue on with these medications for that. Now, broadly speaking, uh, you can divide the class of antipsychotics into two broad groups. The older ones are the or what we call first generation. Those are the ones that we um, developed first, and those were decades ago. Uh, another name for those is conventional. Um, first generation is a term that I typically use. Those are the uh, medications like haloperidol, the brand name of that is Haldol, or promazine, which was the first one we used, the brand name of that is Thorazine. So you see these drugs on the left of the slide there. 
those are the older medications. Now, do we still use them? Yes, we do. Um, some patients either don't tolerate or don't respond to some of these newer um, agents, and we still find patients taking some of these older ones. They do work, um, there's no doubt about that. The side effects in some instances may be more difficult to tolerate for a patient, but we do see patients still on these. Now on the right side of your screen here, you'll see what we call the atypical or second generation um, antipsychotics. These are the newer ones, and these are the ones that we see um, actually most of our consumers taking uh, these days. Things like olanzapine, which is Iprexa, Risperidone, which is Risperdal. So all of these drugs have been um, developed within the last couple of decades, and some are even um, newer than that, and there's some new ones that are in the pipeline even now. So we call those second generation. And in general, um, they're often better tolerated in terms of some of the um, neurologic side effects that you might see from these agents. But as you'll see in a few moments, um, they can be associated with other um, significant side effects also. So this is just, I, I wanted to show you a brief timeline. It was in 1952 that chlorpromazine was introduced to the market. And it was a remarkable change or shift in the way that things like schizophrenia were treated. And it allowed many of these patients to actually not have to be institutionalized. So it was a major pharmacologic milestone. And then a few years later, you started having um, other agents develop. The pharmaceutical chemists and the pharmacologists kept developing things based off that molecular structure. And you ended up having the rest of the what we call first generation antipsychotics develop. Starting in the 1980s, uh, people began looking at, at the drug clozapine and it had, seemed to have some different actions uh, compared to first generation drugs, particularly in that it, it helped certain symptoms of schizophrenia but that we call negative symptoms. And it's, uh, clozapine is actually very effective antipsychotic. It's unfortunately associated with some serious blood um, side effects, uh, particularly with white blood cells uh, that can be problematic. But as that molecule was looked at, then others were developed and you ended up with drugs like risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, and then in the 2000s, a whole host of, of newer second generation antipsychotics. So you can kind of see through, from about the 1950s through today, there's been a gradual shift towards the second generation drugs. So again, just why do we call them first generation? It has not to do only with just their timing, but with the way that they work. They're, they're active against psychosis um, because of their pharmacology on the dopamine um, neurotransmitter system in the brain. And by uh, learning that pharmacology and knowing the structure of that molecule, uh, pharmaceutical chemists and pharmacologists were able to do some modifications and develop some other molecules that um, basically had a sim very similar pharmacologic actions, but then we had a whole host of different uh, agents in, in this class that we could use. So how do they work? Well, the primary mechanism is by blocking dopamine receptors in the brain. And the reason that we think that's important is because it appears that at least the psycho psychotic features um, of uh, schizophrenia involve too much dopamine in certain areas of the brain. And so the, the, uh, these drugs were fairly potent in terms of blocking those dopamine receptors. And what that does is it reduces psychotic um, symptoms, but it's also been shown to help reduce, for instance, mania in uh, bipolar disorder. Now, the problem with these first-generation drugs that we began to see fairly early were um, side effects uh, that, that we would uh, call movement problems. The uh, name a lot of us use is extrapyramidal side effects has to do with area of the brain that they affect. And that would be, um, for instance, slow, stiff kind of movements, um, slow movements in general, but particularly slow walking. It could even look like Parkinsonism um, at that point. And so those are, are um, typically what we see more commonly with these older agents than we do with some of these newer second generation antipsychotics. Another class of side effects that you've heard me speak of before 
in these topics um, are what we call anticholinergic side effects. And that means that they're, they also block receptors for the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And what that leads to is dry mouth, um, constipation. Those are the two big ones that I see, but they can also cause blurry vision and um, some other things. But that's a common problem with many of these older agents. Now they can also cause problems um, for the cardiovascular system. And you can see that as a reduction in blood pressure, which we call hypotension, but also um, conduction issues in the heart, which is we're talking about how the electrical impulses are um, sent through the heart to co control the way the heart beats and contracts. And they can cause ant um, arrhythmias um, because of these actions. And then lastly, sedation. Many patients do feel zonked out uh, when they're taking these medications. And that can be unpleasant. So here's a diagram that I was trying to um, explain here. So you have a, on the left side, you have what's called the presynaptic. So that's neuron, that's where the electricity is coming in from the left. It reaches these little sacs here at the edge of the membrane. And those are like, um, like frankly, little water balloons that have things in it, little neurotransmitters. And that moves over to the membrane, joins the membrane, and it spills those neurotransmitters out into that gap. And that's what those little um, dots represent in the gap. They then come across to the postsynaptic or the other end of that synapse, and they attach to those dopamine receptors. And what happens with antipsychotic medications is they come along and they sit in that receptor and they block the dopamine from binding. And we think that's what results in the therapeutic effect of reducing psychosis. Now, in certain areas of the brain, blocking those dopamine receptors can lead to these neuromuscular side effects that I told you about, particularly things like Parkinsonism. So going back then again, what do we mean by second generation? Well, it's become clear that dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter that's involved in some of these psychotic disorders. It appears that also serotonin is. There are others that people are looking at like glutamate and some other neurotransmitters. But it became clear that it's not just about dopamine. And so when clozapine came around and they knew the pharmacology of it, is that it does block dopamine receptors, but it does block other kinds of serotonin receptors. And it was thought that that leads to several, um, maybe what we could call improvements. So for instance, fewer of these neuromuscular side effects might be related to that impact on the serotonin system, um, less uh, tardive dyskinesia, more impact on the negative symptoms, which we'll talk about later, of schizophrenia, which is, you know, um, poverty of speech, not, not talking very much, isolating some of these kinds of things. And those negative symptoms tended to respond better to second generation antipsychotics. Um, one problem, though, that uh, with the first generation drugs that became apparent with long-term therapy is this side effect that we call tardive dyskinesia. And we're going to talk more about that um, later in this presentation, particularly in how the, the uh, abnormal involuntary movement scale or AIMS scale is used so that we can tell if a patient is developing this problem called tardive dyskinesia because it can and very often is irreversible once it starts. So we want to catch it very early so that we have the best chance possible of keeping it from becoming irreversible. So in general, the second generation antipsychotics have fewer of these movement side effects, a lower risk of tardive dyskinesia, and possibly a better effect on negative symptoms. So as it, again, as I said, we use these drugs obviously to treat psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, um, but we use them for other things like bipolar disorder, um, uh, autism spectrum disorder, also um, a couple of these medications are um, indicated and FDA approved to treat certain symptoms of, of autistic spectrum disorder, particularly outbursts and those kinds of things. They can be used to treat Tourette's disorder, which is a tic disorder, and those tics can either be motor tics, in other words, movements, or they can be vocal tics, and we use particularly the high potency dopamine blockers for that. As I mentioned, we can use them to augment antidepressant therapy for major depressive disorder. Uh, they also can be used to treat nausea and vomiting. 
um, they actually, by blocking these dopamine receptors, can reduce the impulse to, to vomit. And finally, um, we can use these also in the acute management of migraine headaches that are not responsive to other medications. Sometimes patients will be given chlorpromazine, usually by an injection of chlorpromazine, and that can help with the migraine. So I wanted to um, show you um, a, uh, a little video here about using antipsychotics in the population that we take care of, the VMRC population. So let's see, here it is. Let's do this. Hello, my name is Rory Sheehan, and I'm a psychiatrist and medical researcher at University College London. Together with colleagues, I have conducted a study investigating mental illness, challenging behaviour and psychotropic drug use in people with intellectual disability. People with intellectual disability have impairment of intellectual functioning, along with difficulties in one or more life skills. They have an increased risk of developing a wide range of mental disorders, including severe mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia. People with intellectual disability may also show challenging behaviour. This refers to any behaviour that puts the safety of the person or others at risk or limits their involvement with community activities. Psychotropic drugs, which are designed to treat mental illness, might be overused in people with intellectual disability. There is particular concern that one group of these drugs, the antipsychotics, are often used to manage challenging behaviour. In order to investigate this possibility, we use data from the Health Improvement Network, a UK database of anonymised GP records that includes several million people. We identified over 33,000 adults with intellectual disability and followed them up for an average of five and a half years, looking for records of mental illness, challenging behaviour, and prescription of psychotropic drugs. Overall, almost two thirds had been prescribed psychotropic drugs, but only around a third had a record of mental illness. People with challenging behavior were more than twice as likely to be prescribed an antipsychotic drug. And over seven in 10 of those prescribed antipsychotics had no record of severe mental illness. The discrepancy between psychotropic drug use and mental illness recording suggests that these drugs may, in some cases, be inappropriately used in people with intellectual disability. This is concerning, as these drugs may cause adverse side effects, and they should not be routinely used outside situations in which they have proven benefit. Our results highlight a need for strategies to reduce inappropriate psychotropic prescribing to people with intellectual disability. We believe that ensuring people receive the right treatment can be best achieved through a combination of approaches. This will include further research into the benefits and side effects of psychotropic drugs in people with intellectual disability. Alternatives to psychotropic drug use, such as behavioral and environmental interventions, should also be considered. Finally, training of staff and education of patients and carers will also play an important role in reducing inappropriate psychotropic prescribing. A full copy of the paper is freely available at pmj.com. Okay, I think that was um, pretty good in terms of giving us an idea of some of the downsides to using these medications in at least patients who have intellectual disabilities. They do have, um, as I've said, some significant side effects. And when they're used for um, behavioral problems, which they're, they're not really FDA approved for that in most patients, um, we would do that uh, hopefully for short periods whenever something is causing this. Hopefully we'll be able to find out what the trigger is for this behavior and deal with it and then bring them off of these medications. Now they, Reality is that in many of our VMRC consumers, that is not the case. They end up um, remaining on these medications for long periods of time. 
So what are some of the uh, concerns about the using these in the developmentally disabled is that um, psychosis can be seen in, um, in our patient population, our consumers, but it's um, many times not the reason that these medications are being used. Now, uh, one specific instance for autistic spectrum disorder is that um, a couple of these are approved for irritability that's associated with autistic spectrum disorder. It does nothing about curing or resolving the ASD, but it can help with irritability in um, some patients. And as I said, um, they're often used in an unlabeled fashion for aggression and hostility and such things when nothing else really works. And the first step is always behavioral interventions for these kinds of issues with our consumers. But when that doesn't work, clinicians will sometimes go to these medications. Now, one of the things that uh, to keep in mind about consumers is that they, as I said before, they might even be more sensitive to some of the side effects of these medications. And there may also be some uh, drug disease interactions. In other words, some things that these medications could cause a problem with. For instance, diabetes, many of these newer um, second generation agents can uh, cause weight gain, they can cause an increase in fasting blood glucose, changes in serum cholesterol, et cetera, that could, be, uh, could interact with cardiac disease or diabetes um, or obesity, those kinds of things. So when we talk about behavioral problems in consumers, this class of medications really is a second line or maybe even a third line um, approach and we would always want to try behavioral interventions first. So what symptoms usually improve? Obviously psychosis does, but in some patients, the mood may also improve, may be calm down. They can actually improve depressive symptoms. They might reduce anger outbursts and hostility, can improve thought processes. And as I said, in some patients with ASD, they can improve irritability. So some things to keep in mind is that there are common side effects with these agents. For instance, feeling sleepy or sedated, um, becoming constipated or having dry mouth. Um, and some of those are common across all of these classes. But everybody, as I said, is an individual. When we give them these medications, we may see something that we didn't expect or that they're more sensitive to than other patients. So there are some common, which I would think of as really generally not serious. So for instance, if it's mild sleepiness, um, unless it causes them you know, to fall or to have other problems, I generally don't worry about that too much. Up to potentially serious side effects, like um, they can reduce um, seizure threshold, making a seizure more likely in some instances. They cause weight gain and, and uh, hyperglycemia, which obviously is a problem for people prone to diabetes, et cetera. And another thing to keep in mind is that when these medications are added, so we have a patient on two or more of these agents, which uh, is not rare among our consumers, then you can see an additive effect of these side effect profiles to make these things even more common. So one thing I always like to remind our um, our service providers of, as you're taking care of our consumers, you guys are on the front line. And when you see some of these common side effects, um, you wanna make sure that the, the uh, consumers, physicians know that that's what's happening. They may or not be able to express that when they go to see um, their physician. Just a quick review of the common side effects from a gastrointestinal standpoint. Um, some patients almost, any drug we have, some patients can get nauseated um, from it. But the constipation and the dry mouth are probably two of the more common GI side effects. As I said, they can cause dry eyes, blurry vision. Another thing that can happen with these drugs, because they're dopamine blockers, is they can increase the level of a hormone called prolactin in the body. And what that can lead to is changes in menstrual cycle or breast enlargement or tenderness. Um, and if that happens, generally we need to um, go ahead and get a serum level for prolactin. And then if we need to, we can change the antipsychotic or, or um, switch it to something that's less likely to cause that. CNS, central nervous system problems, I've already talked about sleepiness, drowsiness, 
feeling a lack of energy, et cetera. From a cardiac standpoint, we worry about decreases in blood pressure, particularly if a person is sitting and then they stand up, their pressure can drop and uh, that can cause them to actually fall or have a syncopal episode. Um, and as I said, they can cause changes in the heart rhythm um, also. Uh, obviously we can see rashes, that's common with any medication. Other problems that you might see, um, if we stop them abruptly, there's a, there is what we call a discontinuation syndrome, um, abnormal movements and things that can be seen, and uh, changes in white blood cell count, which is most commonly seen with clozapine. Clozapine is a drug where we have to do blood testing in these patients to make sure that a certain type of white cell called the neutrophil um, doesn't go too low, predisposing them to infections. From a neurologic standpoint, we talked about extrapranal side effects, Parkinsonism, akathisia, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a video in a few moments. Dystonic reactions, which are abnormal muscle contractions, restlessness, and then also possibly restless leg syndrome. Now, I did want to take a few moments and talk about the metabolic side effects of second generation antipsychotics. Um, weight gain is um, common, especially with some of these medications. They um, have a spectrum of propensity to do this. I'm going to show you that in a few moments. But all of them, uh, even the ones that are, are considered less risky for weight gain, can actually cause it depending on the person. As I said, everybody's an individual in that respect. They can cause lipid abnormalities or changes in certain cholesterol levels, particularly increasing triglycerides um, and changing um, LDL levels, et cetera. And then diabetes, as I said, which we think is related to weight gain, but it's more than just weight gain. There's some changes in, in terms of physiology that can lead to the hyperglycemia also. And so the American Diabetes Association and other um, professional um, associations have recommended monitoring. So uh, we want to occasionally look at a patient's fasting blood glucose, their lipid panel, their weight, their body mass index, and waist circumference to see if they are um, having these metabolic abnormalities. This slide shows you, in general, where the highest risk is. And what you'll see from this is that for waking, hyperglycemia or diabetes or lipid abnormalities, it's roughly the same progression. Olanzapine, clozapine, most likely to cause it on the other end of the spectrum, ziprasidone, which is geodon, aripiprazole, which is abilify, tend to be least likely to cause um, weight gain, hyperglycemia, and lipid changes. So it, it depends on the drug, the propensity. But again, all of them can do it. So all of our patients need to be monitored for, monitored for these things. So um, in terms of how do we avoid it? Well, one is to do the monitoring that we need to do and also watching appetite. One of the things I talk to patients about in relation to this is to adapt to a uh, healthy lifestyle, which means diet and exercise. So making sure that you're watching what you eat that you're eating a balanced and healthy diet, and also that you're getting some movement. Now, I know that many of our consumers have problems in terms of getting any kind of exercise at all, uh, but within their range of possibilities, can they move? Can they get some walking in or something like that? We need to do regular lab assessments, looking at fasting glucose and lipid panels, um, need to be monitoring blood pressure, and again, as I said, enjoy a healthy lifestyle as much as possible. Now, if problems come up, we can think about inter intervening. We can change the medication or do some other things. One of the newest uh, things people have been doing is using a drug called metformin uh, to mitigate the weight gain seen with some of these drugs, particularly with um, olanzapine. And then there's a new product of olanzapine with a, uh, another drug called samidorphin, which uh, tends to mitigate against this weight gain. So it's something that we recognize and we're trying to do something about. Now, in terms of serious side effects, the things I've kind of mentioned already, decreased white blood cell counts, that's primarily what we see with clozapine, but I've had a consumer who developed a low uh, white blood cell count on quetiapine. 
And uh, that was seen um, on the drug, it stopped. And when the drug was added again, the white count dropped again. So obviously that's a person who is sensitive to that side effect. They inc increase your risk of having seizures. There's a problem called neuroleptic malignant syndrome where you have uh, changes in blood pressure and body temperature and things uh, that can be a very serious um, condition. I personally have not seen uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome in the patients that I've been working with, um, but it's something that we do keep in the back of our mind when we see, see certain kinds of symptoms. Changes in heart rhythm, um, hyperthermia, particularly in the summertime. If you go out in the sunshine a lot, you're on one of these agents, you, you can overheat. They can precipitate uh, glaucoma, particularly what's called narrow angle glaucoma. Priapism, which is a, um, in men, which is an erection that goes on. Um, I think the, the timing is four hours or more or something like that, but that can be a, 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 an actually an emergency situation and diabetes and hyperlipidemia. In terms of neurologic side effects, these are some of the more common ones that I actually see, these extra parental side effects. So for instance, a slowing of the movement, shuffling in the gait, um, stiffness, becoming rigid. Another thing that I've seen that sometimes gets missed is difficulty swallowing because there are muscles in our throat actually that obviously control swallowing things and these neuromuscular effects can affect those muscles and make swallowing difficult. So you have to watch patients. Um, I've had, uh, in my experience in the last 10 years, I've had a couple of patients in the hospital who were started on these medications and then they began to complain at mealtime that they were having trouble swallowing. And it turned out to be a side effect of the um, antipsychotic agent. Other things you can see as pill rolling tremor, which is something that you might see with some of Parkinson's disease, increased muscle tone and cogwheeling, which is where you move their arms and it's kind of like a ratchet um, and those kinds of things. Those are all what we consider neuromuscular side effects. I wanted to show you what these look like because uh, again, you're kind of our frontline um, folks. So I think it's important that you be able to um, recognize this. So let me do this. The things that I think get missed most in the psychiatric population are the slowness and the change in their walking and their posture. Most schizophrenic patients who are treated with neuroleptics don't have significant walking problems or balance problems, even though you may see that they're a little bit stooped and they don't swing their arms so much. And they may be a little slow, but it doesn't really interfere with their activities all that much. And in a sense, you can understand it. If their psychosis is under control and the patient's not complaining about something, terrific. You know, leave well enough alone. You know, why rock the boat? But I think there's a lot of Parkinsonism that goes on uh, that's just not recognized. Or if it is recognized, people say, well, that's the price you have to pay in order to get adequate psychosis control. Do you ever have tremors? Do you ever notice that you shake? Yes. My thighs you? shake a lot and my, and my fingers shake a lot. Okay, does that bother you much? The other problem is that they're often not able to supply history. A little bit. They often tolerate drug side effects because they've lived with them for 20 or 30 years. And I think they probably just shrug their shoulders and say, this is part of what's wrong with me. Plus they've been treated for so long and the development of these things may be so gradual that they don't perceive them. You take a drug and all of a sudden your head twists like this, you know about it, you say it's the drug, very clearly identify. But you develop Parkinsonism, which develops over days, weeks, or months, and people don't know it. They notice when they have a tremor. So if their hand's going like this, they'll say, oh yeah, I shake it's from my medicines. But if they're like this, and they move slowly, you know, their balance is a bit off, they won't recognize that. And frequently their doctors don't either. They all recognize the tremor. But beyond that, they frequently don't identify the other thing, the stooped posture, the absence of arm swing, 
and the bradykinesia. Those often go unrecognized. Now with the right hand go like this. This fellow has facial masking. Can you hold it sideways now? There you go. He has diminished, and this, he's not much older than me, and that would be normal. Yeah. On the left hand, you see he's very, very Brady kinetic. Okay, put your hands down. Up and down, the whole leg up and down. He's tapping his leg up and down, and he should be able to get a much, much higher amplitude and better speed than he's generating right now. So these are manifestations of the Brady kinesia. One of the issues that I face relatively commonly is like him, the issue of a person who's being treated with an antipsychotic who develops Parkinsonism. And the question then is, is this purely drug induced and will go away completely never to return if they're taken off the drug? Or is it Parkinson's disease sort of unmasked prematurely by drugs that do that? Like the typical neuroleptics and respiridone and to a lesser extent the lanzapine. So I can't tell whether he might have underlying Parkinson's disease, but it did get better off the old man's And back into the room. Now, psychiatric patients can be visibly affected by their antipsychotic treatment. And I don't want my patients to look like they're on antipsychotic medications. We talked about your concern about the medicines you were on, that you would look medicated in these interviews. Could yes. you tell me about that? What was the concern about that? I am afraid that I'm not expressing a full range of emotions, that I look kind of rigid, that I look kind of medicated, and that people can tell that there's something wrong with me, you know, just by observing me. One of the terrible things about EPS is that it brands you as being on medication. Well... It's kind of an, an unemotional quality about it, you know, a lack of animation. And the meaning of EPS is that they're visibly stigmatized by the side effects. Right. Just imagine what compliance to AIDS medication would be if you took a protease inhibitor that gave you some sort of physical side effect that made everyone know that you're on a protease inhibitor for your AIDS. I mean, think about that. Now, if you have a side effect that saps you of your energy, that may not be a problem when you're an inpatient and you're just going to groups or OT and you're not really stressed or taxed. When you are then discharged, that mild Parkinsonism will turn into major Parkinsonism. Turn around, do it one Even if the time. side effect hasn't changed, because the person's now back out in the real world and has to get a job. Around. So it's a major problem. Do you have any problems with slowness? Thanks. Okay. Do the letters of the alphabet. I just want to hear how you talk. A, B, C, D, E, F, C. So a mild Parkinsonism on an inpatient ward turns into a severe Parkinsonism for the patient when their functioning improves. Creating. Hopefulness the approach to treating one of these patients is to put them on an antipsychotic if they need one, which doesn't cause Parkinsonism as a side effect, or which doesn't worsen Parkinsonism if the person has Parkinson's disease. When you were counting off on your finger, you're shaking stuff. Did you notice that? Yeah, and you hold your hands together and you put your hands in a lot. Hold it like this is just the mind just sick of the tips, but you know, basically have to stop. There are only two drugs that don't worsen Parkinson's, which are clozapine and quetiapine. That to me is the treatment of choice. You might advocate using either an anticholinergic or a mantidine. But if you have a drug that causes side effects, the best choice is to get rid of the drug that causes side effects rather than to add on yet another drug to counter those side effects and then contribute new side effects from the new drug. So it makes sense to try to transfer that. Okay, so 
something I want you to um, particularly notice there when you were showing those patients with the Parkinson type side effects is the slowness of the movement. And that can create a real issue for our consumers or for, for others, patients when we're giving them these medications. So another problem that I've mentioned already is called akathisia, and that's um, a lot of restlessness and inability to stay still. So you may see them pacing, um, you know, jogging their legs, uh, repeating, uh, sitting and standing, sitting and standing. They just basically can't stand still. And it can be severe enough that people have a problem with human sleeping. And uh, it's thought that it may even increase the risk of um, serious uh, injury, you know, behavioral issues to yourself and aggression in people um, who have developmental um, disabilities. And it can start as soon as you start the medication or within a few days. Um, so let's take a look at what akathisia looks like. Okay, so notice how he just keeps moving. Okay, he's in constant motion. I've seen this um, in the hospital. We start a patient on a medication, and most often I see them just pacing the hallways. They, they, they don't want to sit still. They don't want to be in the room, laying in their bed or whatever, and they're walking up and down the hallways. Now, it's hard to tell if that's akathisia or anxiety or something else along those lines. So generally what I will do is go um, actually walk the hallway with the patient and I'll ask them how they feel inside. And if they're feeling very restless inside, kind of this inner turmoil stuff, then that's a good idea that it may be akathisia. And of course we can treat that by either reducing or um, getting rid of the antipsychotic or changing the antipsychotic. But we can also add a medication called propranolol. There's some others, but we primarily use propranolol where I am that can actually reduce um, what you're seeing there. Now, there is another class of, of uh, side effects that we call dystonic reactions. And those are basically sustained painful contractions. It's like having a Charlie horse. I think you could see how that would be um, painful. None of us like those kinds of things. So commonly we see like, uh, sort of rigid uh, tongue protrusion. You can see the throat um, clamping down, upward deviation or movement of the um, eyeballs. There's a thing called torticollis where you basically are turning and looking over the back of your shoulder. I think where you can see, you can see where that's sustained, that would be um, painful. Often this is something that we see very soon after the medication has been given and it can be dangerous. So for instance, if you did um, have choking, etc. I think you could see how that could be a problem. So I wanted to show you here an example of um, an acute dystonic reaction where the person is being seen in the um, emergency department. So when, when did you start having trouble talking? Oh, oh. Oh, oh, uh, oh, uh. Early this morning. Uh, and did you take any drugs uh, uh, other other than your prescribed drugs? Oh, uh, no, you don't do cocaine or anything like that. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, okay. Count to ten for me. One, two, three, four, five, uh, 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 uh. Um, okay, that's good. Okay, wait. I mean, I'm very good. 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 I'm I feel better. I am good. I can't believe I am good. 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 I
Has, has the, the pupil on this eye, has it been bigger than the, the pupil on your other eye for a while? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It has. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But has that ever been, been ever since you had your head injury? Yeah. 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 Okay. Still want to spin the head. Let's talk about it. Um, count to ten for me now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine. All right. Oh, no. Okay. Now it's him. Now it's him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel better. I feel better, better. Now better. your your voice your is voice isn't right? perfect, but is this how you normally talk? Uh, no. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But your speech is still a little slurred. Yeah. Okay. Let the doctor give me the Benadryl and the doctor knew exactly what the purpose was. The purpose is what the purpose was to give me some Benadryl and that's what they did for me. Give me some better drink. Now, are you talking back to normal for you? Is this, yes. is, this, is this how you talk? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you had some traumatic brain injury sometime yeah. in the past. Is yeah. that right? They kill our brain. Okay. And so, but you have you have some uh, psychiatric issues too that you're being treated for. Uh, I mean, have a uh, 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 we have a flashback. Flashbacks. Hey, so you know you have your your. Uh, right guard over there and sometimes people actually puff that to get a high on it what? yeah but were you, were you using the right guard at all no no you weren't I didn't use it with the other. <laughs> the other that's using it like it's supposed to be good okay yeah. well that's you're very kind to the rest of us you know you're, you're. okay i think you get the idea from that um one thing i want one point i want to make from that video is uh, we do see these kinds of what are called dystonic reactions in the hospital uh, particularly when patients are newly started on these um, antipsychotics and uh, what we do is we do give benadryl the generic name is diphenhydramine and it's remarkable in that you can see these really dramatic side effects and you give them 50 milligrams of Benadryl. We typically in our hospital do it IM intramuscularly. And within just a few minutes, you can see these um, reactions turn around very quickly. So it's fortunate that in many cases we can deal with them. But imagine though, if this happened uh, to this young man when he wasn't in a situation where he could get to the emergency department, if he were you know, especially if something were to happen in his throat. So this is something that we do want to pay careful attention to. Now, the problem that I talked about being a long-term problem, uh, consequence of taking these things for at least six months is something we call tardive dyskinesia. What we mean by dyskinesia is abnormal movements, okay? And this can occur in any um, area of the body. Commonly, I see it in the head and uh, face area, the jaws with abnormal movements, the tongue protruding, but it can occur anywhere in the body. And again, this is something that occurs with long-term therapy. And the problem, the real problem with it is that it can, it can progress and it can become irreversible. And so the things we see is chewing, lip smacking, puffing, uh, blinking of the eyes, these sorts of things. And I'm going to show you um, some pictures of that um, just in a moment, so that you'll be able to see um, what it looks like. But the point I want to make, and the reason we're talking about uh, watching our patients for this, is so that we can intervene early. So that if you see any consumers who are taking any of these antipsychotic medications and they begin to have abnormal movements, you clearly want to let their prescribers know immediately so that we can intervene early and reduce the likelihood that it becomes irreversible. So let's take a look at tardive dyskinesia. We 
Yes, go ahead. Stop, stop, stop. All right. Now do it again. Start over. It started a year ago with the time of jerking it up all the time, but it progressed pretty quickly within about three or four months. So it's it's got it's got worse. Okay, this has gotten worse since I've seen Dr. Cobb. Oh, really? Now I have a stutter and more this kind of a more complex set of movements around the mouth. It looks like yeah, well, the inside of my mouth over here hurts for my teeth. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty frustrating for all of us. Okay. The pretty good. Okay. And how much eye close? How much problem with eye closing? Any of that? Any 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 and um, and she does has she does she have I remember I'm, I'm sorry yeah, I'm sorry to get to know your situation as well. Just right. with you. And and her past medical patient history, she does have something that brain land or something that would be a liability for this type of problem. She mm -hmm. is not. No. Mm -hmm. Less so it'd be less common with this, but I guess that's why I did see that back in the trailer. So, but it's not zero. Um, so and there's there have been more and more cases reported. Is that right? Like like zero two? Okay. Yeah, it's real true. Okay. Um, and they, they do tell you know, they tell us when we prescribe these medicines that they can't say that it's a zero risk, it's so they must be the older risk. So. Well, how much benefit did you get from the from the RT, which is say percent wise? We'll see. We're only starting with half twice a day. Right. And then starting today would have been half three times. Oh, okay. So we're just getting, So you're just but, getting but I can tell you that um the way it's changed my life is that it, it's it's made me able to perform my daily function. Okay. Not not really, but as in after just a few days was not set sedated, but the effect would wear off after about two and a half hours. So okay, like four and a half hours mm -hmm. to three. Okay. Because we didn't want it to because I was scared of that. Right, because so then we tried the Clonopin and that only lasted about four days. But the for very for first pill that I took, I fell asleep for like five hours. Yeah, so then mm -hmm. I tried taking half. Um, mm -hmm. three times or whatever instead of four mm -hmm. and I still wasn't conscious. Like I couldn't be uh, bothered. Mm -hmm. That's why I called Bob and asked him to try with the RT on okay. Saturday. And even though we're just still ramping it up, I can tell that then it, it's 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 pretty darn effective. I would say that even at the low risk I'm at, it's probably fifty percent. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, so really so you're less of the involuntary movements and less of this friction on the Inside mm -hmm. your lips, well, that's very you know, you know that the Ativan was so effective <laughs> that the movements rarely happen. Okay, but instead of it lasting, say, five hours like it was in the natural lab, I mean, you know, slow position and the effectiveness was why it didn't happen. Oh, okay, so it's like something short, you know, more common. Excellent. It's habituating, and and, and, this, and that's so you get the same, you get habituation for the benefits as well. So, um, well, I'm very encouraged because it'll be a lot if we can find a medication that can help reduce this, and maybe, you know, something like Ativan if you have flare ups or situations in which it may, you know, more of a problem like a as needed type of thing that might be it might offer you the best benefit because we, you know, we. We use Botox for these things, but the more complex the movements, the harder it is to get full control with the Botox because we can't do all of these muscles. And um, you know, the external facial muscles, it's easy to, to overdo it because you can get drooping on one side of your face and food fall on it. So people don't generally don't really like that. And then the opening part, um, we I'm currently trying to work out a plan for taking care of that with someone from the um, and neck surgery group. Because as Bob may have told you, the person in our department who did injections for the jaw opening is no longer here. And so just a couple things I wanted to point out um, from that video 
is um, clearly you can see those abnormal movements and they were really a problem for her. Um, but they mentioned medications in there. And a lot of times the medications that we've used in the past have not been very effective for tardive dyskinesia. They mentioned um, Ativan and they mentioned Clonopin. Now those are benzodiazepine medications that may help some patients. And you heard her say that Ativan helped in the beginning, but then it wore off with time. That's not uncommon. Uh, we've tried using the anticholinergic drugs. You heard them mention Artane, and in some patients that can provide some benefit. But there is a new class of medications out there that's available. In fact, they're even advertising them on television now um, that may help um, some patients, and they're specifically given for tardive dyskinesia. On the downside, they are extremely expensive. And so we would have, if we had to give this, we would need to make sure that the insurance company pays for it because they're almost prohibitively expensive. So we generally use what's called the abnormal involuntary movement scale or the AIMS scale to screen patients for potential tardive dyskinesia. And it can be used periodically and um, should, should be done periodically. I'm gonna show you a video about how it's done. It's not that I expect you to be able to do the AIMS uh, scale with our consumers, but I'd like for you to understand what we're looking for. Because if you know what we're looking for, then if you see it in a consumer, you can bring it to the attention of their prescribers. So let's take a look at how it's done. It may be useful to think of the AIMS examination as having two parts, one informal and the other structured. The AIMS examination is scored by observing and rating the severity of the abnormal involuntary movements in seven different body areas. A scale of zero to four is used. Zero is used when no movements are present. One indicates minimal involvement and should also be used for movements which may, in fact, be extreme normal. Two is for mild movement. When the informal observations have been completed, the structured portion of the examination can start. Since standing over a patient may make him uncomfortable, it's best to sit next to the person. This allows the examiner to easily demonstrate the required movements. This is an appropriate time to discuss the purpose of the examination. Your description should be brief and to the point. Excess explanation may only serve to increase anxiety and confuse some individuals. The first step of the AIMS examination requires the examiner to ask the patient whether there is anything in the mouth, such as candy or gum. If there is, it must be removed. Second, Ask the patient about the current condition of their teeth. For example, does the patient wear dentures? Do teeth or dentures bother the patient now? Patients with tooth or gum disease may develop oral movements which mimic those of tardive dyskinesia. Dental status becomes important when trying to make a differential diagnosis. Instruction eight of the AIMS examination has the patient tap their thumb with each finger as rapidly as possible for 10 to 15 seconds. Do one hand at a time. The primary purpose of this exercise is to distract the patient. Due to the concentration required to perform the exercise, previously suppressed movements will frequently appear. The examiner should not be concerned with how well the finger tapping is performed, but instead should look for any facial or leg movements precipitated by this exercise. Do not score mirror image movements of the opposite hand. Please note, item eight is often referred to as one of the activated movements. Some examiners score this portion differently. This scoring variation will be discussed in a few minutes. Mentally score each segment as you view it. Near the end of each piece, the correct score will appear in the lower right corner of the screen. This is the score of a practitioner panel. The segment number appears in the upper left corner. Remember, abnormal involuntary movements are scored from zero to four. 
Zero denotes the absence of any movements. One is minimal. It may be useful to think of one as extreme normal, movements which are borderline. Two is mild. These are movements which are decidedly not extreme normal. The person obviously has some degree of abnormal involuntary movements. Three is moderate and four is severe. This segment features a rather subtle lip movement. Notice the sucking in the lower lip. You may think this movement is minimal and give a score of one. This would be too low. Remember, one is used for borderline movements, movement which may actually be extreme normal. This movement is too persistent to be extreme normal and should be scored two. The patient in segment 10 has constant jaw movement. Notice the frequency and amplitude of the movement does not change. It is the same before, during, and after the activating exercise of extending the arms. This is a good example of why a point should not be subtracted when scoring movements detected during an activating exercise. Segment 11 is quite short and will be shown three times. Notice the increased frequency and amplitude of this woman's jaw movements compared to the previous segment. The fourth body area to be scored on the Ames examination pertains to the tongue. Pay particular attention to whether the tongue breaks the imaginary vertical plane connecting the upper and lower teeth. This automatically warrants a score of three. Segment 12 shows a borderline tongue movement. When this man opens his mouth the second time, there is a quick jerk of his tongue. That portion is shown twice. Without further observation, it would be difficult to justify more than the minimal score of one. The jerky movement observed may only be extreme normal. This segment illustrates a mild movement disorder. Sufficient movement is observed to rule out extreme normal. This woman is attempting to stick out her tongue. It is not uncommon for patients to have difficulty with this maneuver. A mild movement disorder is obviously present. Okay, so the thing that I wanted to make sure you get from, from this is that we need to be watching our consumers closely because many of them are on these drugs for literally years. And the longer you're on one of these medications, the higher the risk. Now, again, the risk uh, potential differs with medications and um, uh, some drugs, the second generation antipsychotics are thought to have a lower risk, but um, um, you saw one patient there just uh, before this video who was taking Zyprasidone, the brand name is Geodon, and uh, she had tardive dyskinesia related to that. So any of them can cause this, uh, but this, in general, the second generation drugs have a lower risk potential. Now, how can you help? Okay, well, again, you are the ones who observe our patients. All of these things I've shown you today are things that you can see things like weight gain, uh, things like abnormal movements or stiffness or slow walking, slow talking, these what we call Parkinsonian or Parkinsonism side effects. So by knowing that, then you can let the caregivers know so that they can be evaluated. 
um, I, I showed you the Ames uh, scale and how to do it so that you could see the kinds of things um, that these patients would display. And some of them you may not notice. I mean, a lot of times we don't see people flicking their tongue or whatever. And again, it's really important to let uh, someone know when you're seeing these things so that they can see their prescribers. So that's really it for today. And a quiz is gonna be made available to you by email. And all you do is send a, an email requesting the quiz from Vicki and um, she will send it to you now. She's getting married as you hear, so it's a holiday. So you may want to wait just a little while before you request the quiz. This uh, Zoom recording will be posted on the VMRC website so that you can see it anytime again. So as I said before, you can complete the quiz. You can either um, print it, put your answers on there and scan it and return it by email, or you can simply send an email in with your answers on it. There are five questions you need to get four right in order to pass and get credit for this. So once again, thank you for attending. If you have any questions, you can email me at pharmacist at bmrc.net and I will get back to you. So I will see you next um, January. We're getting ready to repost our new schedule for 2022. In the meantime, I wish you all a really wonderful holiday season and a happy new year. And I will see you in January. <music>